welcome back TCS TV viewers. It's Jordan and I'm not just the video guy today. I'm the video and stills guy because Sony gave me a really nice opportunity to take their new RX100 Mark IV with me on my vacation. So I've actually had a chance to use it, process the images the last couple weeks, not just in a test scenario, but how people would actually use the camera. So we're going to take a look at that today. So Sony's RX100 Mark IV made a lot of sense for me as a vacation camera because they've made a lot of improvements to the video side, which you know would be very important to me. Um, and some improvements on the still side as well. So I was going to see, could one camera cover the entire trip for me? Would I miss something a little more comprehensive? Now the nice thing is we got a lot of beautiful locations to look at today because, you know, Calgary can look nice from some angles, but uh, sometimes it's a little bit less photogenic. Ugh, John Cougar Mellencamp's Aha uh -huh album. It's a shame to see great art treated this way. Now every version of Sony's RX100 cameras has always had kind of an external improvement to it. When we went to the RX100 Mark II, we added a tilt screen to it, a hot shoe. The RX100 Mark III added the brilliant little electronic viewfinder design. And looking at the RX100 Mark IV, it's essentially the exact same body as the III. Uh, no real difference externally. It does have that same beautiful EVF on it. Nice thing is it's world sharper now. But most of the improvements are all internal with the new sensor. So this Exmor RS sensor, it's a stacked CMOS design, and I'm not even totally sure I understand what that means yet, but the advantages in camera are we're getting a very fast burst rate, 16 frames per second at full quality on it. It's also going to give us phase detection covering almost the entire sensor, so autofocus performance, and especially tracking, is much better with this new sensor design. The other big thing is it's giving us a ton of functionality in video. We're getting full sensor readout, shooting 4K. We can even move this thing up to 240 frames per second in short bursts, shooting basically full 1080, all the way up to 960 at admittedly pretty terrible quality. But it's a lot of advancements for this sensor design. We're going to go into some detail on those. So with such an emphasis on speed on this Exmor RS sensor, you're going to need a hell of a processor to actually take advantage of that. And Sony's clearly thought about it, because check this out. We're shooting at 16 frames per second right now. You're getting about three to four second burst on that. And those are full 20 megapixel files. So it's moving a ton of information around. It's pretty amazing. And that processor is what's also giving us those great video features on this. You got to remember these kind of video specs and still specs on a camera a couple of years ago, you're looking at seven, $8,000. It's crazy what they've packed into this thing. Now with the new sensor, I was naturally really curious about the image quality on this. And looking at the images, initially they looked a lot to me like RX100 Mark 1, 2, or 3 files. That sensor is all over the place and it's beautiful image quality. This looked very similar to me at first, but one thing I've always found with the Sony's, you know, the JPEGs keep getting better every camera, but they're still not really the best out there. So I was looking forward to looking at the RAW files and that's where these images really come to light. So bringing the RAW files into process, I was immediately kind of blown away by a couple flubbed shots I'd taken how much information I could pull out of the shadows. And the one inch sensor has always been quite good for that. But just to test things, I shot the same image on an RX100 Mark III and an RX100 Mark IV quite underexposed, pulled them up. You can see there's a lot of information in the older sensor, but I can pull them up on the RX100 Mark IV with next to no noise penalty. It's really amazing. If I were to take any point and shoot for doing landscape photography, any kind of high contrast shooting, this is the one that I'd grabbed. I'd put it in line with a lot of APS-C sensors out there, on this little camera. It's pretty spectacular technology. So we have the same lens in the RX100 Mark IV that we had in the RX100 Mark III. We're getting a 24 to 70 equivalent f1.8 to 2.8 lens. So it's nice, it can give you a little bit of depth of field control and yeah, the range might be a little short for some applications. I really like it. Usually when I'm shooting, I just carry around a 24 to 70, nice and bright. And the thing that really stands out to me is this lens is sharp, even wide open here at the long end I'm shooting at f2.8. And you can see cropping in, there's tons and tons of detail. Now it's not a real improvement over the previous version. We're getting about the same resolution, about the same high ISO performance we did with the RX100 Mark III. The dynamic range seems to be the big thing that's been improved on this, but it's still outstanding. These are still the gold standard for compact cameras for image quality. Now the EVF has always been one of my favorite things on Sony's RX100 Mark III and they've sharpened it up. It's now a 2.36 million dot EVF. Uh, it's very, very sharp, but I mean, look at that thing. That's dinky and the magnification's very low on it. It's actually quite difficult to see the entire frame. I have to shift my eye around a little bit. And the other thing I found while I was shooting out in BC, I've got to press my eye right on it because it's not shaded at all uh, just to see everything. And I had to mash my face into it so much, I just caked this viewfinder with eyeball sweat, um, just fogged it right up. 
you got to be aware of that. You know, it's, it's great to have the EVF, but it does have some limitations making something that'll fold into a body this small. So let's get out of that place. I didn't touch anything, but I still feel like I could use a bath or a tetanus shot or something. Uh, let's talk about the autofocus on this guy, because that's one of the big advantages with this new sensor. We get phase detect on the sensor and really wide coverage on it. Now, point to point, I found it was pretty similar to the last RX100s. It's no slouch, certainly, but it's still bested by something like Panasonic's DFD system that you'll see on the LX100 or GH4, G7, GX8. But once this thing hits focus in continuous, it just hangs on. It tracks incredibly well. Now, bear in mind, this is a smaller chip, so it's a little bit more forgiving when it comes to depth of field. But still, I would have no issues shooting this any kind of action, family stuff dogs, pets, things like that. It's pretty spectacular. So the RX100 Mark IV is a very capable still camera, but thankfully I can stop pretending that that's really important to me and we can move on to the video stuff, which is why I found this camera really exciting. With the new sensor, we're getting 4K, we're getting crazy slow motion support. They've added S-Log, it's got the XAVC compression, and this thing is like a dream as a small body for videographers, so let's take a closer look at that. So there's a lot of cameras starting to show up with 4K support. But looking at this, it does something a little different. Because it's doing full sensor readout, we get the same field of view whether we're shooting 1080 video or shooting 16 by 9 stills or shooting 4K video, no crop. And the image quality is really beautiful. I saw no issues of moiré, aliasing with it. And it's a very natural look. It doesn't have that kind of over-sharpened, over-processed look that I saw from the Samsung cameras, for example. It's beautiful quality, and it's going to cut together really nicely with some of the bigger cameras, like an A7S shooting to a Shogun, or honestly, even like an FS700, FS7. So the thing everybody's talking about with this camera is its high frame rate modes on it. A number of people who have come into the shop and said, hey, do you have that new Sony that shoots 960 frames per second? Uh, guys, the higher frame rates on this thing are honestly pretty atrocious. You can see some examples at 960 and 480 right here. But what's really interesting to me, this thing shoots gorgeous 240 and 120 frame per second video. Uh, you can see some snippets here. No moiré, no aliasing, and rolling shutter is next to non-existent in these guys. So yeah, we're only getting two seconds record time in the real world, but remember, 240 frames per second on a 24 frame project, that means we're getting 20 seconds in that one clip. That's a lot of time, and if it's a 30p project, you're getting 16 seconds. European people, I don't want to do the math for you, grab a calculator. But there's some serious limitations with the slow-mo. How the camera works is you set up your focus, exposure, all that stuff. Then you have to go into a pre-standby uh, mode, kind of a preview, and the camera locks up. So I can't focus anymore. I've got to wait for the action to happen and then hit record. It's great if you've got pre-planned stuff, but I was trying to get a lot of grab shots on the street in Victoria. It's very difficult because I want to focus. And if I try to focus, it sticks a big, cannot proceed on the front of the screen, uh, blocking my view before I then go and record it, it's really tedious. Uh, and there's one other big problem with that pre-record mode. It chews through the battery very quickly. I thought I'd do end trigger mode, and then I'd just hit record after the action had happened. And when I did that, I found I was getting only about like 15, 20 minutes out in the real world shooting, which meant I only had like two minutes of footage coming back. So you've got to use that pre-record mode sparingly. You've got to plan your shots when you're shooting slow-mo with this camera. So the RX100 Mark IV has one other real trick up its sleeves. If we're shooting a high contrast situation like we are right now, it's really nice to have the ability to record log. It's going to give you a flat, gross-looking image like you can see right now on the GH4 with V-Log that's shooting me. But you can grade that, choose whether you want the shadow information, highlights, opens up a lot of flexibility. Takes some time to do, but it's really, really useful. Now, the log does have a drawback, same as all Sony cameras. The lowest ISO that you can use shooting S-Log on this is 1600. So you might think, oh, we've got to drag around a lot of NDs. It is nice. You've got a three-stop ND filter built onto this. So that basically gives you 200 ISO when you're shooting log. In bright situations, you might still need a bit of ND, and there's no filter ring on this. That makes it a bit tricky, but the log files from this are gorgeous. I would really compare them to the FS700, as crazy as that might sound. Uh, shadow noise is quite well controlled, but like all log formats, you need to know those deepest shadows are going to be incredibly noisy. You can choose whether or not you want to use them, but uh, if you boost those up a little bit, you got to know you're making some compromises, you're going to get some noise. In most situations, I'd crush them down, but the amount you gain in the highlights still absolutely makes it worth shooting log. 
So it was great getting a chance to actually test a camera for a couple weeks. And what I came away from is the stills on this, the dynamic range is what really surprised me. It's amazing how much you can pull out of the shadows. And the files have always been beautiful on this. Sharp lens, great sensor, but it's video I was most excited about. And the quality is, it's exceptional. Like I would compare it easily to an FS700 recording internally. You know, it's harder to use, but the quality is there definitely. Now, that being said, I did want this to be my camera that I could shoot stills and I could shoot video with, jump quickly back and forth. And that's where my biggest issue with this camera came in. Sony menus are notoriously terrible and as the cameras get better and more complicated, they keep getting worse and worse. And I'd find myself often wanting to jump between you know, shooting stills, shooting video. And every time I did that, I would have to go into the menus, turn my ND filter off, take it out of S-Log, which I actually have to go into the hard menu for, move my focus from manual focus over to continuous or single point. You know, I was looking at probably 30 seconds between, which meant most of the time my shot had already gone by the time I'd switched the camera over. I really think the RX10 Mark II is gonna be a better hybrid option if you can handle the size, just because it has more controls on it, more function, more external dials. But if you're looking for something pocket size that's just giving you exceptional quality in stills and video, I can't think of anything more well-rounded than this. Before I would have said the LX100 is a serious contender, but I would take this guy over it. A Little more clunky controls, but everything else, this is the gold standard for compacts now. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Check us out on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, you know, watch us on Facebook. I'm sure there's more. Subscribe on YouTube, and we'll see you guys next week.